FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Well, Janet Yellen, first FOMC meeting, then a blunt press conference makes you believe that something's got to give. And here to talk about it, Danielle Park. Danielle, welcome back. Hey, how are you, Carrie? Okay, so man, she talked about as blunt as you could, said interest rates are going up, taper off to zero. I'm still skeptical, but what do you think? I mean, is she telling the truth or is it just more Fed speak? No, I think the way that people like Miss Yellen looks at it is she says, you know, in her theory, she's done the job that was uh, required. In other words, the whole point of QE from the get-go was to bail out the U.S. banks. And since they have done this now for five years and they've turned a blind eye to every possible illegal behavior and skimming and front-running and, you know, they let them control the commodity market the past five years. I mean, it's just been anything and everything was permissible under this goal of getting the U.S. banks recapitalized. So after five years of that, I think that this Federal Reserve is at a point where they, the, the mission has been accomplished in their view. They looked at the stress tests that they put the banks through last week. They said, great, everybody basically passed them. We put them under a scenario of what if we have another major recession, which is due any day here. And the banks all seem to have enough capital, at least on the test that they prescribed, to withstand that. So in their view, mission accomplished. And I'm reminded of the... Um, 1930s period again as a as an example where you know Eugene Mayer was the um, head of the Federal Reserve in the crash of 29 and in the early 30s and for that first period after the crash of 29 the Fed stepped in to to backstop the banks and to paper over and to cover up all the nonsense that had gone on all the reckless policies uh, you know the government at the beginning was just looking for the evil short sellers no one was concerned with who had pumped up the system enough to blow it up uh, which was was the bankers, of course. So everybody was focused on how to get the banks from, you know, the verge of bankruptcy through. And once that mission was accomplished, then the Fed looked at the banks and said, you know, you guys are grossing us out, basically. I mean, you've had your way. We've done everything in our power. We've prostrated ourselves in order to support you. And instead of being, you know, instead of learning from that and becoming more responsible in your operations, you've become more emboldened. You're incorrigible. You, you've been breaking every law and doing everything illegal. And, you know, at some point, Mayor just said, I give up. You guys are beyond reproach. You're beyond help. You're beyond ethics. I think that's where this central bank is now. I think they have done what they perceive to be their duty, mission accomplished. And when Richard Fisher last week, who's always been a critic of QE, but he's a voting member, when he said last week in an interview, you know what, uh, QE is completely exhausted. I think that was the most direct message anyone has ever been able to say about the policy to date. And that was exactly because, as I say, in their mind, they've hit that finish line goal of banks reliquified, and now they're backing out. And I think that she believes that it is okay to back out because let's face it, they've been you know, holding, plugging their ears and whistling the whole time in terms of what's going on in the real economy. In their view, they can pretend like everything's got better in the real economy. And so they're doing that specifically, as I say, because their only goal was to reliquify. And in their view, that's been accomplished. So I do think she's going to continue to taper that this $10 billion pace. And I do think at that point, you know, they are expecting their bill to raise rates. I doubt they'll bill to raise rates because I think the next global recession is upon us. And, you know, the triggers have been things like the standoff in the Ukraine and the Russian debacle uh, and also the massive one, in my view, the biggest catalyst right now for slower global growth is the China credit bubble imploding. And they're letting companies go bankrupt, um, which have been happening now on a daily basis over there. So that credit crunch in China, I think, is just another shock that an over-levered, undersaved world cannot absorb. And that would, you know, anything at all could tip us into a, a massive contraction. Um, and I think these are bigger than anything at all. These are pretty significant catalysts. 
And then we get to the point, Danielle, if that's really the case, if they're really going to start doing it, and maybe they should put up a banner on the front of the Federal Reserve Building at uh, Liberty Plaza in New York City, and I always wonder, why is it built at Liberty Plaza, the Federal Reserve, after all, and no greater sign of servitude than the Federal Reserve, but maybe they should put up a banner mission accomplished, banks bailed out. But if they're going to do that, who's buying the treasury debt now? Because China can't buy it and the rest of the world has no money. They're dumping the treasury debt. And if that's the case, there's no buyer of last resort. What happens next, Danielle? What's going to happen? Well, next next would come fiscal discipline, Carrie. Next would come the need to cut spending, believe it or not. Next would be the having to... Uh, stand up to the crony capitalism that's been sucking the coffers dry of America for the last, you know, five years in particular. I think at this point, that's when the politicians who have been along for the ride doing sweet you-know-what will have to go back to the drawing board. You know, my theory all along has been that free-flowing tr- credit has allowed a polarization in the political process where no one's had to negotiate because everyone could get their way, right? The the far right has been able to pretend that they are, uh, you know, they've been able to criticize the social services but get all their crony benefits uh, the way they'd like them for their constituents. The Democrats have been able to criticize the, you know, the the capitalist handouts, but, you know, get all their social programs paid for because they just kept extending the debt. So if you cut that line of credit so that it just can't keep growing, then you're going to find that you have to go back to the drawing board and it's going to force people to negotiate. Hey, and then you're going to have mass defaults of municipal bonds, of conceivably a lot of state bonds. You're going to have a total restructuring of government finance, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, you're saying here, Danielle. Well, you're seeing that already, right? You're seeing that, um, that well, any Ponzi scheme, any, you know, uh, system that's requiring constant new inflows of capital to just keep making the payments. So in other words, it's not an investment. It's just a a uh, pretend and extend policy to keep cash flow coming. Every one of those policies. In other words, what I'm describing is it's been this way for the last six years since the credit bubble burst. We've just not admitted the fact. So, uh, you know, China uh, should have it, it's its total debt is now above 200% of its GDP. It went into the 2008 crisis at you know something like 120% or 80% debt, it's much lower than present. Um, so they had that you know they had foreign reserves to ru- run to the rescue and try and bail out the uh, the credit bubble economy of the world and hopefully get the demand cycle restarted. But now five years later, they've repledged those same reserves multiple times over. You know they've uh, they've done their own Ponzi uh, experiment over there with, you know, bad debt on bad debt on bad debt and multi multi pledging the same collateral all over and over. So, you know, they don't have the cash. And, and that's why I say there's there's a bunch of selling of U.S. Treasuries going on from places like China. And I say not strategic, but desperate. They need to raise cash. Uh, they've been trying to they've been intervening in their currency market for the past, you know, five years. Uh, as a way of getting liquidity into their banking system. And now they're just not able to keep that up. But here's the thing. We've had this mass manipulation in so many markets, commodities, currencies, equities, you know, bonds, across everything. You know, what uh, what um, uh, James Montier was calling this hideous opportunity set in his article uh, in the last few days. It's, it's really worldwide uh, price mechanism has been disrupted by artificial hands. But here's the thing. Uh, when that retreats out of necessity because they're simply not able to keep it up because there's not enough money in their own coffers to pay what, you know, basic operations so they can't speculate and waste a ton, when that starts happening, the path of least resistance is lower prices everywhere, not higher prices. You know, this is what I find ironic is that people say, well, the Chinese have been manipulating their currency, so they assume that once they stop, doing all that open market stuff that the Chinese currency will rebound higher. No, I say it'll go lower because the fact is that they have a very weak demand cycle in their own economy. Just 30, 30 something, 38% of their consumption of their GDP comes from 
personal domestic consumption. The rest of it is dependent on exports, which, guess what, aren't coming back any day now, Carrie. The whole world's looking for exports, uh, people to buy their exports, and everybody's in a cash crunch. So once you see that that's the case, um, I think the U.S. dollar continues to be the least ugly in that scenario. I think, you know, the, the smackdown that's happened in gold and, and uh, precious metals and silver uh, in the last, you know, while, several months, well, actually since 11, but in different bouts of it. I think once you get, you know, the Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan's of the world having to sell off their commodities uh, hoarding business, because now, you know, the pressure said, listen, we gave you five years to abuse the hell out of us all and make profits, but now we have to put our foot down. Uh, once they start backing out of that, you see lower prices everywhere. And I think that that is ultimately the self-correcting mechanism that helps because right now you've got a problem with too high of assets and too low of incomes. So there's not enough people who can buy and consume the goods at the current prices worldwide. Once you get this deflationary sell-off where everything comes back down to realign itself with actual wage growth and earning, you know, spending ability in the real population, then you get some price discovery. And that's actually a healthy thing. Now, it makes, you know, like I said for years, you knock off zeros and everybody goes down relative to one another, but ultimately it's a cleansing process and it's good. So I think this past five years has been all about bailing the banks. That mission is accomplished in the eyes of the, of the academics, and now they're going to let the thing um, resolve itself through this, you know, notional idea of market forces. Well, we're going to talk more about this up next on the Financial Survival Network.com with Danielle Park and Carrie Lutz. When your accountant wants tax free income, this is what he does. Accountants know the law. They also know that any American could legally get paid up to three times per month, 100% tax free. That's 36 tax free checks each year. It doesn't matter what you make already. This simple strategy could work for anyone. Go to www.irsrevenge2.com to learn how. That's irsrevenge, the number two, dot com. And we are back. So, Danielle, look, uh, you can't expect the transformation that you're talking about here that you believe is going to happen. People are going to get dragged to this kicking and screaming and indeed have been. So all of the conventional remedies, i.e., money printing have been exhausted and now reality is coming back to bite us all in the butt and in places like china food could become scarce in certain places instability and we're seeing food riots across the world now we're seeing food prices take another hike up you're going to see instability all over the world here from governments really uh, really uh, battening down because the people are just not going to put up with having to spend 120 or 130 percent of their incomes just to buy food they can't afford to stay alive effectively the world's going to get really unstable according to what you're saying and if they're not going to print money anymore in the u.s to paper over the deficits you're going to see major realignment major just a major change of everything that we know and love in this country, in this continent. I mean, what's going to happen here? Well, the thing is that the real economy has already gone through this process to a very large extent. The real world has not had a income gain for a couple of decades now, okay? So the pain that's been felt in the general populace has been going on now for several years. The difference, I think, in letting, once these asset bubbles deflate, once they can't be backstopped and churned and burned any further, the difference is that those who are left on that, in that uh, musical chairs game, which are the quote, you know, 0.1% um, who have had this sort of uh, false uh, increase in their net worth in the past few years, they're going to be the ones that get hit the hardest this time, which, you know, it, it Everybody, no one can have it all their way all the time, right? So anyone who is wise enough to, you know, participate, ride it up, sell it off, and there's been lots of people, you know, insiders selling to weaker hands, to the poor retail guy who's just been attracted back to equities in the last few months at these record highs. 
Um, so there's been strong hands to weak for sure in this cycle, and some people have cashed out. But those who believe, who have, have bought their own, you know, um, nonsense here, who have believed this fable that the, the economy is rebounded and all is well, are going to get their comeuppance now, just like everybody else in the real economy has already experienced. So again, I see it more of an equalization process than as a radical change for the most of the people. Um, yes, food inflation is, go- is an issue here. However, again, I go back to, you know, there's been manipulation in the food markets of the world, in the commodity space, in the grains, etc., by all these investment banks just as there has been in all the other commodities markets the past couple of years in particular through QE. It's been all this, you know, loose liquidity sloshing around the planet um, has driven up the cost of things that matter to real people. So as you get them exiting this space, partly out of, you know, uh, regulatory uh, controls partly out of lawsuits that they have to settle and negotiations they have to come to where they agree to sell off units and sort of, you know, right size themselves a bit. Um, that as they exit that space and th- there's less hot money flowing there, I think you see prices come lower, as they say, lower, not higher, and that will take off the pressure because there actually is a lot of supply in the world today. There's a ton of supply in most commodities all over. They're stockpiled. They've been hoarded and held because someone was making a a dollar on a speculation rather than on selling to the end user. So once you get that those artificial forces out, and part of the start of that is the QE. The start of that is the tapering, coming back out, and then as I say, the other part of it is all this settling of all these legal claims and suits and uh, admissions of wrongdoing, et cetera, that they've been having to come to in the banking sector. As they exit that, and as QE liquidity backs off, you're going to get some price discovery in those areas. So I think that will, because again, it's not that we don't have enough food in the world today, it's that it's not flowing through to the consumer because it's been held by all these speculative forces. What about unemployment? Uh, Because at least in the banking sector, which had a disproportionate share of employment and employment gains, you're starting to see contractions, starting to see the big banks lay off people. So unemployment's going to go up here, and that's going to be bad, right? Well, again, uh, that sector has had the... um you know, they tend to be the higher paying jobs, they tend to be the college graduates, they tend to be the people who have had this very low relative unemployment rate, you know, something around 5% um, in the past few years, while the general economy is, you know, 8 to 11, 8 to 12% unemployment. So yes, those higher, higher paying jobs, but it was, you know, again, huge overinvestment in the banking sector and the credit bubble. And then in the speculative phase we've lived through for the last five years, as we were doing everything to service the vampire squid. So now that, you know, they're having to back out of all these uh, frenzied lucrative trading plays they were doing at everyone's expense, of course, they're going to have to lay off. They're going to have to downsize that sector as they should. It's interesting. Everyone's been talking about the biotech bloodbath uh, selling off uh, extremely in the last you know, uh, couple of weeks. But Goldman Sachs is also significantly lower in the past uh, week. And you know, uh, I was about to put a chart on the blog, but basically it's made a lower high just recently than it did in, in 2007, 2011. Um, so if it's rolling over here, that makes sense to me because there's no question the banking profits are under huge assault. Um, and as are corporate profits in general, because sales have been weak and now they're kind of at the end of their, you know, uh, accounting gimmicks that they can keep up. So it's just a slower growth world, Carrie. It's not the end of the world in my mm-hmm. view. It's a slower growth world. And the only thing that has to happen here is asset prices have to Re, re um, connect with that slower growth world, and then prices will come down significantly. And a lot of the intense pressure that's presently on the consumer, which is already tapped out uh, through years of of you know lack of income and lack of correct investment in so many sectors of the economy, we've had malinvestment and underinvestment in these in favor of all these speculative forces. Now that those speculative forces are in retreat, I think it's ultimately a healthy thing. Um, and yeah, it'll it'll create some unemployment uh, in some of those higher end services, but hopefully it'll it'll uh, force people to retrain and go back and find something more useful to do with their time than all these speculative running the casino stuff. Hey, you know, 
that's such a great point because we always talk about malinvestment like in housing like in in just business like empty cities in China but we never talk about malinvestment of human capital which is yeah. aerospace engineers not working at aircraft designers or yeah. or in aerospace entities instead they go to wall street and come up with new algorithms for ultra high f- speed trading and that is yeah malinvestment of human capital on a hideous scale. And I know for myself, I feel like, uh, you know, I went into law and other things and maybe I should have been making things, but yet in the United States through the policies that were adapted EPA and other things, it became really disadvantageous, especially in the Northeast people in my years just didn't go into manufacturing. And that was a bit tragic, in my opinion. So maybe a lot of that will be reversed as a result of the trend that you're really outlining here. Well, people generally don't make any significant change until they're forced to. It's kind of human nature. Uh, Some people are proactive, but most aren't. Um, so I think my biggest criticism of, um, in, in terms of, yeah, not just the trillions of dollars that been, have been wasted in, you know, buying up useless financial assets, not just the trillions of dollars in malinvestment, you know, the $30 trillion more in global debt that we've accumulated over the last five years. If we could have accomplished something for that money, that would have been one thing, right? If we could have retrained workforces, if we could have developed, doubled down on all these innovative energy solutions, which we're needing desperately in the world. And P.S. Look at Russia. If we did, you know, if we could be more self-reliant, we wouldn't. If Europe could be self-reliant on energy, they wouldn't be, you know, having to do all these deals with the devil, so to speak. But there's so much opportunity in the world, and you know, there's, there's obviously there's been capital available, but it's just been wasted, and that's why five years later we're actually in a more vulnerable position than we even were five years ago, which is kind of a tragedy. But as I say, uh, you know, hopefully because we've done everything possible in the wrong way, now people will be forced to actually think outside that box and look at at, at more productive ways to invest and grow an economy. And, you know, the the Japanese experiment continues to offer everyone that's interested a playbook for how it doesn't work. Uh, you know, despite all the weakness in the Japanese yen, they continue to lose market share in their exports. Um, you know, it, it, it's just this QE stuff has been the, the death of us, truly. Um, world glo- world trade prices, the growth rate has been deflationary since 2012, but it's now in full retreat again. So as I say, prices for things that matter in the world that people use have to come lower, and they have been. And that is a step in the right direction. Reconsolidating and, and reducing oversized sectors that were blown up by bubbles in financial markets, that's a healthy thing. Let's get that, you know, that workforce reallocated, retrained, Uh, people focused on the things that matter again. Great point. On that note, Danielle, we got to go find you at jugglingdynamite.com. Must reading if you want to see what's going on in the global economy. Good perspective. And of course, there's a link on financialsurvivalnetwork.com in the show notes to this interview. Danielle, we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Stay warm. (laughs) Thanks, Gary. I will try. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 